I'd like to thank everybody for being a part of our, of our interaction this evening. Dr. Jablo is going to present for about 40 minutes or so and take your questions at the end of the, uh, the, end of the session. So feel free to share either using the Q&A at the bottom of your screen or send us a note through the chat function. We'll tee up as many of those as we have time for this evening. And if you could stick around, we're going to have two polls in the middle of the session just to take your temperature on some issues related to hand piece selection. And if you stay and complete the survey at the other end, we'd love to know how we fared tonight, some things that we can continue to build out in future sessions. And we're going to give away an iPad if you participate throughout the series. We'd really like to have that feedback. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Jablo kicked us off. He's got a wealth of knowledge, has been an educator, a speaker, an authority in dental technology and dental materials for uh, for really some years at this point. He's a uh, frequent contributor to the association meeting podia in the dental journals, and he's got a wealth of knowledge that we're privileged to have him here and share with us tonight. So um, if you can bear with us, we welcome your questions, the chance to interact with you. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Jablo. Thanks, Rich. So um, that's me. Um, I graduated from New Jersey Dental School uh, it seems like many years ago, all right? Um, probably more years than some of you have been alive, but you know, it doesn't matter because then fortunately, the good of dental school is still there and the horrors of dental school, from what I've been told, are still there too. But we all get through it and that's the best part. Um, and then you get to practice and you get to do what you want, hopefully, and experience some um, the fun of dentistry, because I have to tell you, I've had a lot of fun in dentistry. Um, when I was in dental school, the first thing I would want you to know is I never, ever, ever expected that I'd be sitting on the other end like this, trying to educate people, dentists, students, you know, hygienists, assistants, never was a thought. You know, I was going to dental school to be a dentist. And uh, now, uh, as I like to say, you know, when I was in dental school, they taught us how to uh, refer when it came to orthodontics. You know, now I give orthodontic lectures. It, it's, there's a world ahead of you guys and gals that you just don't know what's going to be there um, 5, 10, 15 years down the road for you and take those opportunities and make the most of them. Uh, they don't have to be sitting in an operatory all the time, although I am a, you know, what they used to call wet finger dentist, but now it's wet gloves. Uh, you know, I'm in the operatories. Uh, I'm in the trenches, and I know what it takes to run a dental office and, and treat patients. So um, if you've got questions, happy to take them. And you know what? If it's not about this topic on electric hand pieces, but some tech question, shoot me an email. Happy to try and help you. That's the goal here, um, long-term uh, support. So let's get into this. All right, um, we want to thank NSK Dental. Um, they're the ones who are uh, sponsoring tonight's uh, webinar. And without their support, uh, I wouldn't be here. So, you know, thank them uh, when you go to a dental meeting in, or they come into your uh, school, give them a big thank you. All right. I cannot possibly tell you everything about what you need to know about electric air hand pieces tonight. That's just not going to be possible. You know, 45 minutes isn't enough time. And if, and if we went more than that, I'd bore the heck out of you. And that's not what we're here to do. I want to give you a good overview of both air and electrics, differences between them, why you might want to consider one over the other, and then it's up to you to take that information get as much information from other sources, and make good decisions later on. Right now, you may not have that choice, but at some point, hopefully in your careers, you get to make those choices and find out, you know, the benefits of what the equipment you're looking for and find a method to make sure you don't make mistakes. Because the biggest thing that I see in technology purchases is fear. And that fear is something that we can't, you know, get past because everybody wants to know, what if I make the wrong decision? If I make the wrong decision when I'm buying high ticket items, you know, it's a costly mistake. And we really don't want to do that. So again, you know, figure it out, take the time that you need and ask the right questions, you know, write them all down. And then when you go, whether it's to a dental meeting or you're checking a website or sitting through a webinar, you know, get those questions answered. 
So we want to talk about the possibilities here. And, you know, depending on your school, you may have access to both air and electric hand pieces, or you may be one and not the other. And there's limits and benefits to all of them. So what we need to do is go over those things, but you always have to keep your mind open because there's possibilities that we don't know. There's, there's people out there who I get to, to interact with every single week and they're, they, they're tweaking things. There are different things that, in different techniques and in different equipment. And some of it's simple and some of it's complex, but the possibilities are always there. As long as you can think, you're gonna have a possibility to do something different. And in dentistry, one of the things we all do is something different. Nobody's the same. Everybody treatment plans differently. Everybody preps differently. Everybody's got their own thing. That's one of the benefits of dentistry. So what we're gonna to cover tonight and get this thing going here. All right, we're gonna talk about the history of hand pieces. And you're gonna go, oh my God. Um, I remember some of the history. I am that old, but <laughs> not all of it. All right, we're gonna talk about air-driven hand pieces, electric hand pieces, and hybrid electrics, all right? Because not everything's the same. And then what I mean by that is there is no one size fits all for anything, you know? You get that T-shirt and it basically comes in large and it fits many of us, but it doesn't fit everyone. And you have to remember that from size, weight, shape, all of those things matter as an individual. And you want to definitely hold these things in your hand. You want to make sure that they fit your hand properly. I mean, women's hands are usually smaller than men's, um, and then you might need a different size motor. Um, you know, if handpiece fatigue is something in your hands, you may not experience it now um, early in your career, but there's plenty of people who experience it later on in their career, but their hands start giving them problems. And these are things that you have to take into account. Uh, you know, what's the size? How does it fit? How's the balance? The ergonomics of a handpiece. These are the, the important things. And again, one size will not fit all. So what do you want? You know, Uncle Sam says he wants you. Well, you know what? What are you looking for? Are you looking for something that's easy, cheap, and you can fit in a bunch of operatories? Well, he might be looking at air. Then somebody will say, well, but you have to have an electric hand piece. Well, electric hand pieces are good, all right? They come, they, they cut differently. They're not the same as the air. And then you have this hybrid hand electric hand piece where it's kind of air and it's kind of electric, but you don't have all the benefits of an electric hand piece, but it's a little bit better than air. Again, you know, what's your budget? How many do you need? You know, we've got sterilization protocols, so having one isn't going to do it. You're going to need multiples. Can you, you know, afford to, to get into that whole situation where you have multiple um, hand pieces in your office, and now, you know, how quick can you turn them over? It's really important. And we're going to talk about the evolution of the hand piece, where we started, where we're going, and, you know, where it is. So hand instruments, and I don't have the old hand instruments to show you with the wood and the, thing, the hooks coming out of it. I mean, this is how dentistry was done originally. If you really want to see hand done in dentistry, you can go online and just kind of Google some YouTube videos of, how, of street dentistry in India. And you will see people with different hand instruments basically doing dentistry in the street, but they're only available tool is a hand instrument. And that's how we all started, and, you know, dentistry started. Then in the 8, 1780s, you know, we had the Arado, and this was wound up. There's a big spring in there, and you'd crank that thing and watch it spin. You know, this was state of the art. You know, think about that. That's Paul Revere, okay? <laughs> you know, he was a dentist, and that was, that was the kind of stuff he might be using. Then we got to the foot pedal drill. Again, you know, it seems kind of barbaric, but you know, this is what was state of the art in the probably mid 1800s. And then it, we had the first electric hand pieces in 1938, and you know this was a big thing um, when you think about it. And then 
it was like, this is what we use. Now, I also go back, I'm old enough, and I'm getting to be one of those dinosaurs, <laughs> all right? And where I'm looking at when I was a kid, all right, I had, they had these big units that sat up in front of you. They were stand-up units, all right? Mostly was made by a company called Ritter, and they had these big belts that spun around, all right? And that's how they drove the slow-speed hand pieces on these big belts, kind of like what you're seeing here in this electric. And then they had, you know, air hand pieces, which came out in the late 1950s. So, okay, we're getting closer, you know, it's about 75 years or 70 years, um, and this changed dentistry. These were the high-speed hand pieces that basically changed dentistry um, in the late 1950s. Okay, Rich, start the poll. All right, gotcha. All right, everybody, we're gonna take just a quick second. Before we continue on, I'd like to just have a, a quick understanding of what you're using today. Are you using an air-driven, electric, hybrid electric, or are you not yet using a hand piece? Uh, maybe that's coming down the road for you in the next semester or so. Let's just leave the poll up and take a quick pulse of the audience and get a feel for where everybody is. Interesting. Wow, that was fast, everyone. Thanks for participating. We're almost there, Dr. J. Okay. Just a couple more seconds. Got almost everybody in already. All right, I'm gonna let a couple of stragglers go through. Oops, some the last ones. A couple <laughs> more of you. Got about 70% of you already completing. All right, we're gonna take just too much more time, so we're gonna just finish the last of these responses and display. It should have been, I don't know. <laughs> Got about eight seconds left, seven seconds. Okay. All right. About 70% air driven. Okay. And that that's, as you're going to see later, we're going to get into this and that's not uncommon. When I was in dental school, that's, that's all we had. Um, I, my real surprise here is that there's actually somebody using a hybrid electric. That's, that's, that's a really interesting part because that we don't see too much of that out there, um, even in the marketplace. But um, looking at that 70-30 ratio, that's about normal here, and we're going to get into that in, uh, in a second here. So you want to pull that down for me, Rich? You bet. Coming right down. Okay. Okay, not letting me advance it, let me see here. Okay, there we go. So those are our two current choices. We either have air or we have electric. And, you know, that gives you benefits both ways, all right? And with that, we have to understand how we're gonna select a handpiece and why we're gonna select that handpiece. Really, really important when we look at this picture because this is the tool that you're gonna use day in and day out, and you're gonna get used to doing it that way. And we need to understand it. So we, we know now you know, what you're doing in school, all right? Uh, and I don't know even with those folks that are using the air hand pieces whether you get a chance to do electric, but I would tell you that um, I would hate to do dentistry without my electric hand pieces at this point. Uh, they just cut so much more efficiently uh, than anything else. And with that, um, you get the, there's a whole bunch of benefits with that. But let's look at numbers and let's talk about air turbines. Um, and as you see, there's about 76%, and that was pretty much what we saw in the poll. Um, dentists in the United States, all right, are using air hand pieces. And they spin it, you know, normally about 400,000 RPMs, and there's some that'll go higher, some that'll go lower, um, but that's, that's a standard uh, hand, air hand piece. But, you know, how much speed do you want and how high do you go? I mean, speed is in everything, all right? Um, because, you know, you can spin that burr quite a bit, but really what we want is torque. We need power and torque. That's really what it is. Now, if you've taken an air hand piece and you've ever what we call bog it down, you can stop it. That just shows that you don't have enough power and torque in that air hand piece. 
You know, maybe the settings on the unit are too low that you don't have enough air pressure to keep it going. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that go along with that. So you have to be aware of some of it. The average torque on an air handpiece is, you know, is somewhere between 10 and 20 watts at this point. Um, there are a few uh, different hand pieces that go above that, which kind of max out around 28, 29 watts. Um, and, and that's really, you know, the power. And what that means is that's the cutting power to go through the tooth, all right? And so the higher torque means the less stress on the, on the hand piece and the less stress on your hand. Um, with that, you know, air hand pieces don't offer the same amount of torque as an electric one. And that's really where the time it takes to cut the prep. How easy does it, does that, you know, tooth cut? Um, and especially now when we're, we're into uh, zirconia crowns and you're taking off a bonded Emax crown, you know, these can really cause you a, a, it's a pain to do it and it takes a lot of time. So the more power you have and the more torque you have, the better it's gonna be to remove those crowns. And we'll show this slide later. Airs are also noisier, all right? At 70, 80 dB decibels, um, that's about the equivalent of a vacuum cleaner. So you've got this vacuum cleaner going on, and that's why a lot of times there were dentists who had hearing difficulties. Now, my past stuff was always, um, I had uh, my, from college and through dental school and a little beyond, I worked in the rock and roll industry um, on the stage and concert promotion. Um, doing the, you know, the, doing the roadie stuff. And I always wore hearing protection. And I actually carried that into my dental school career where I, I wore hearing protection in the lab. Um, I used to put my head down on the desk and that handpiece with the model would be right there and that thing would be blowing in my ear. So I always wore hearing protection in that, in, in my ears. And it's really important. We all lose hearing um, as we get older, just part of the aging process, but we don't want to accelerate that any more than we need to. Um, the typical air hand piece is about three ounces, so it's very light, lighter than uh, an electric, but again, you're gonna carry it longer just to get the same job done. I switched to electrics because it, just like a Swiss Army knife, it allows me to do a whole bunch of things with one handpiece. That's really the key here is that it's versatile. Um, and in the, the, in the big picture, it may actually save you money. So what's the advantages of an electric? Much higher torque, all right? Um, they last longer. If you've ever had um, one of the things that we used to do when, when we had the uh, using a lot of airs in my office, we would have to replace the turbine. And in fact, I bought a, I think it was called a score press. And we used to buy the little uh, turbines and you'd open up the top of the handpiece and you'd pop out the other one and you use this press to put it in and, you know, seal it back up again. And you'd have a whole bunch of those and they'd last three, four, five months. And then you'd do it over again. And that was just part of it. Um, the hand pieces to repair the electrics are going to be more expensive, but I don't maintain them on that normal time frame. Try, you know, we maintain them on a daily basis, you know, lubricate them, things like that, make sure they're sterilized and clean. But, I, you know, I can't even remember the last time I had to send in an actual hand piece for repair. It's, it's very infrequent. It's going to be more costly, but it's very infrequent. Um, the other thing too is, that when there's a flexibility, you know, when we, if you're in dental school or even in most private practices, the, the high speed handpiece is your bread and butter. And then you have the low speed handpiece and it's usually not used with water. It's usually you cut dry. Well, you know, when, if you've ever done that cut dry and you're taking decay out of the tooth and you see all that junk that gets caught up in the burr and everything else, and then you, hand, you, you, know, you hold it up and if you have an assistant, they wipe it and it's not you're wiping it. Um, you can cut wet with that same slow speed um, it, it, because I don't have to necessarily have different burrs. I don't have to have a latch burr. I can have a round burr that's on the same, you know, friction fit uh, lock. And then what happens is I just swap out 
the that the the bar and I change the number of RPMs. All right. So the great thing is you have a flexibility depending, and we're going to get into it a little bit further on, of, you know, from 5,000 to 200,000 RPMs at that higher torque, and it gives you a whole bunch of, of, of effort is just reduced. You can also get a straight nose cone, and if you want to adjust the denture, you can almost burn the acrylic with that much torque, all right? They're quieter. They're about 50 dB. So it's about the, the, the sound of probably most people talking, um, you know, talking a little loud, or uh, maybe about me right now. I'm always told I talk loud because uh, I'm used to talking in a big room and trying to get my point across to the, uh, to the folks at the other end when we're pre presenting. With that, you know, so you save on your hearing and you save the patient some of the noise. Now, having said that, most of the noise, whether it's from an air handpiece or an electric, isn't, you know, the actual what you're hearing. It's going through bone conduction inside your skull, and, you know, you can't uh, totally eliminate it. But, again, quieter is better. And, you know, they, they also feel the vibration. Those are also some things that may be interpreted as, as noise to the patient. So, you know, when you have cutting it with an electric and it, it doesn't have that same vibration that an air does, it doesn't shatter as much. You know, you've got, you can get better margins and better fit because you can actually adjust the speed in an electric handpiece to exactly what you want. So if I set that to uh, $200,000 and I press down on the rheostat, it's going to $200,000 if I press it all the way, $200,000, 200,000 RPM if I press it all the way down. If I set it to 50,000 and press it all the way down, the most I'm going to get is 50,000. And it's important because you can finesse margins, you can do things um, at slower speeds and not have to worry and not play with the feathering as we would talk of the rheostat. They're very well balanced. They, you know, a lot of times what we'll do is, uh, and I don't have a pen down here in, in front of me, but we'll hold our hand up and you'll actually rest the handpiece inside the crook between your thumb and your forefinger and see how it balances. You know, how does it fit your hand? And all of those things are important to decrease hand fatigue. So you, if you're going to start thinking that you're going to cut off a roundhouse and prep all of those teeth, you know, I, you're going to be there for a few hours and it's going to matter, especially if you've ever hand fatigue when you're trying to pull on cheeks and tongues and everything else to retract them and out of the way, your hands can definitely get tired. And wearing gloves isn't, you know, isn't helpful in that matter either, especially if they're not fitting properly. So it's real important for that also. And then what are the indications? Well, the great thing about an electric handpiece is you can do endo, implant surgery, um, oral surgery. All the dental procedures for the most part can be done with one handpiece, one motor. Um, that's the benefit of an electric handpiece. All right, so again, when we were looking at it, about 16% of the dentists, you know, we had about a 70-30 split um, here because, you know, it depends on what the, uh, the, uh, the school is giving you. But, you know, in the real world, that's what we're looking at. About 200 RPMs is a, is a regular high speed in an electric. So you were looking at about twice the speed, but it's not about speed. It's all about the torque. 60 watts compared to 28, 29 at the most for an air-driven handpiece. So you've got twice the torque. That means you can get the job done faster. All right, that's plain and simple. Pedal to the metal, get it done. And the difference is, is I talk about when an electric handpiece as more like milling a tooth. The same thing as if you were watching a Cerec or an E4D mill that tooth inside that mill, that's exactly it. I can put that burr into the tooth and literally drag and cut all at the same time. I'm not trying to feather it like with an air hand piece back and forth, trying to, you know, cut through it that way. This thing just cuts through a tooth. You cannot bog down or stop an electric hand piece burr. It's not going to happen, ever. There's just way too much torque. So that's one of the big benefits here of an electric hand piece. Now, if you've got to cut off a bunch of zirconia crowns or a bridge, boy, let me tell you, that's not a fun job, and an electric handpiece makes it much easier. 
Um, you, you're going to use diamonds, not carbides, just so you know. But the real key here isn't necessarily 200,000 RPMs. I will drop that down to something like 100 or 125,000 RPMs in my electric with a, with a diamond, and I can cut through those zirconia crowns much easier. All right, they're less noisy, or, you know, like I said, 55, 60 dB is about a normal loud talking, um, and they weigh a little bit more than uh, an air handpiece because they're just, you know, the motor's inside of it, not being pushed by air. Um, but if they're balanced properly and they fit your hand properly, you're, you're not going to really notice it. They do require a controller box. Um, there's many, many different controllers out there. Um, the good thing is they've got memories. You can, you can do a whole bunch of things. This is the NSK with the small motor. Um, there's no, this isn't a fancy thing to, that you have to have somebody else install. You can plug these in yourself. It's very simple to do. And you can control with this one motor box, um, high speed, low speed, and then uh, reduction hand pieces all from the same uh, box. Very simple to do. You can also reverse the, uh, the motor. So you're spinning in the opposite direction. You'll say, well, when would I ever need that? Well, if you're doing endo, you may have want rotary endo, you may want to reverse it. If you're the unfortunate uh, dentist who has to back out a broken implant screw, you may want to reverse it. Same thing with a fractured post. You know, so there are reasons that you might want to reverse the motor, and you have that ability with an electric handpiece. And they come in all sizes and shapes. Um, the one in my operatory is controlled by an iPod, all right? Um, and I can take that iPod into different operatories and just drop it in, and all my personal settings come with me. Uh, but as you see, they all look similar. Um, and they have the ability to do similar things. When you're going to buy one of these, though, you need to make sure that they have enough settings for what you're looking to do, especially if you're looking to try and use the same motor for endo or implantology. That would be something that I would want to make sure that they, you can, you know, dial these motors down low enough to do that. Now, there's different size motors and the motor's attached directly, you know, into um, your air line because you're going to use your rheostat to control it. And again, you may want something smaller like this NLX Nano or the conventional size uh, hand, hand piece motor. But now you get all different attachments. So if you look here on the far left, you have this red band. Now, this, this terminology is good across all the manufacturers. Everybody uses the same thing. So what you're looking at is a, is, a, is a one to five, and that's basically the equivalent of your high speed. So on an NSK motor, if you wanted to use that, you'd, see, you'd set it to the red, and then you would push it up, and it goes from basically, I think, it's zero to 20. And you would, at 20, you would get 200,000 RPMs. The blue is a one to one hand piece, so you would consider that your slow speed. All right, and then you're 16 to one, and there's some 14 to one, the green bands. Um, that can be used for endodontics, for rotary endodontics. You can also use that if you wanted to do um, implantology. You know, you can, you can actually get high enough torque and low, you know, low RPMs. Now with that, you know, I'm not gonna necessarily totally recommend it. You still, for implantology, gonna need some irrigation. That can be externally from your assistant, you know, squirting it in, or you would have to adapt um, these hand pieces um, to do that. Now, there's some, you know, obviously there's some electric motors that have the ability to do that and add external um, irrigation, but then there's some other ones that you can use which would allow internal irrigation and be able to do your implants that way. So it's just something else to think about in the big picture, you know, as to what's happening and how you're managing it. So again, the red stripe is a speed increaser. This is, this is going to be your bread and butter handpiece. This is the, the high speed. This is going to cut your preps, you know, you know um, crown and bridge your operative. This is, this is the workhorse. This is the one that you're going to need lots of them for. All right. This will take, you know, standard friction grip, uh, burst. 
whatever they may be. These will take those standard friction grip burrs. You push the lock on the top, slide the burr in, and then you get to work. Very, very simple. The blue ones, you know, in come in, in different ones. Now, they may take, you know, they come in two sizes, the standard, which is going to be your friction grip, and then there's also ones that actually will take your contra angle grips, you know, the one with the latch grip. So with that, you could use different burrs if you've got, the, you know, your round, round burrs, you know, a four round, an eight round, whatever it is, um, or polishing, um, you would want to use this one-to-one -one hand piece. And the green one, again, is going to be a reduction hand piece. Um, again, pick the ones that you're going to use for the burrs that you're going to need. Um, will they take your rotary endodontics? I use these for rotary endodontics. Um, I don't use these. Uh, I do actually use this hand piece for the different motor than what I use every day for my implants when I'm placing implants um, because of the irrigation. And I had the motor. You know, that, that's it. Just got used to using it. And I, totally programmed for my implants. You know, it's as simple as hitting the buttons, one, two, three. Um, and I go from like a thousand RPMs to start, you know, my osteotomy. Then obviously, you know, as we're, we're going to do further osteotomies, you know, with bigger burrs, you know, we're going to bring down the RPMs and increase, you know, know what the torque is going to be and set the torque and, you know, do that. And then obviously when we drive the implant in, um, if we're not doing it manually, you know, I can get some feedback, you know, when that thing beeps, I know how much torque has been placed on that implant. And uh, hopefully at that point, you know, we know, uh, you know, it's not floating. <laughs> we got some good 35 plus Newton centimeter torque in it. Uh, and it's gonna be good somewhere down the road. That's what the green ones are for. Um, and again, you know, what's the procedure? You know, you, you're going to select the handpiece based on your procedure. So again, red would, would be good for um, restorative. You can use it for caries removal. Um, I don't use a red one for polishing. That would be more of a blue one-to-one. Uh, -one. And the donics are the green because we want the reduction and implants also would be the green ones. And again, why is that important? Well, in a lot of things, you're going to read that the burr speed, the RPMs, are important. These are the cerebers from uh, Comet, and, you know, they say the optimum speed is 1,500 RPMs with spray coolant. Well, there's not too many people who've got slow speed hand pieces that are easily going to be able to do that, and the maximum speed is 40,000 RPMs. Well, what happens, what's really great about these burrs is that if you use them at these low speed settings and, and the coolant, it basically only cuts the K. It's not going to take out good hard dentin. It just goes through the decay. And, and they're really cool little burrs to use, and, and they last a very long time. Uh, but there's an indication here, and these are latch-type burrs, but that's an indication of why an electric handpiece is really beneficial because you can control that just that way. You know, try doing that with a, with a regular air-driven uh, slow speed. It's not going to be, you know, all that easy to do. What about these? I like to, I call them rubber bullets. If anybody's ever taken one of these uh, brownies, greenies, or super greenies, when you're polishing something and you revved it up at 400,000 RPMs in a high-speed handpiece and watch that thing disintegrate and fly off, and if it hits you, you know it, so that's why I call them rubber bullets. But if you look on the package, the recommended speed is only 5,000 to 7,000 RPMs, yet plenty of dentists put these things in a high-speed handpiece and just, you know, they try and feather it, you know, because it's 400,000 RPMs and things are just going to, you know, take off. But look at what the recommended speed is. And again, that's the benefit of an electric handpiece is just dial in whatever you want. On mine, I have a setting that just says polish. And I could put polish brownie on it if I wanted, and I know when I want to do it, I hit that button and I've got whatever speed I had set, and maybe I'd set it somewhere in the middle. I think I have it, I do have it set to about 7,000 RPMs. But that's the difference. And then when, no matter how hard I press on that rheostat, I only get 7,000 RPMs. And that's 
that's just the super way to do this, you know. It, it's just the way you want to practice. And the same thing, you know, what's the speed range is what I was talking about just before about implantology. Uh, you know, can you then, you know, do all of those things? Do you have enough torque? Is it going, in, in many cases, some of these electric hand pieces could do this, but they may not have what we would call, you know, the benefit, it's not going to beep when you get to 35 newton centimeters or 50 newton centimeters. So again, you know, you have to understand what you're doing and the benefits of it, but with that, you know, you can, you can pick and choose. You know, if you, if, you know, if you say, hey, you know what, I'm just new into practice, I just opened my office, I really want to do a whole bunch of things and I don't want to spend lots of money. Well, I think the best money then spent would be for, you know, electric hand pieces over a air hand piece. And then, oh, I got to get an endo motor. Oh, and then I got to get an, uh, an implant motor. Those would all be problems eventually. You spent a lot of money. And guess what? I did. Yeah. I did spend that money. I mean, I have one, excuse me, <coughs> I have one motor that was an endo uh, implant motor. I haven't used it for endo in years. I just use it for, um, for, for implants. Only because I got used to it. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's it? You get greater control of the burr because of that torque and the ability to move things around and control the speed. That gives you better tactile feel. And again, safety. You're not going to have burrs disintegrate on you. You're not going to break burrs. You're not going to have things go wrong when you know just because you're you're not using the burr in the way it was designed and when these companies are designing the burrs, they're fully aware of some of these things, but there's a reason that they put that information right on the label is because they don't want you over revving these things, but there's plenty of dentists who do. All right, so you get that greater control. I usually, when I'm gonna finish a margin, something like this, um, I wanna definitely bring it down. I wanna bring it down to 50,000 RPMs. That's something that, you know, we want to make sure I get a good margin and I don't want to lacerate gingiva, things along those lines. Okay, Rich. All right, folks. Thanks for staying with us. We're going to pose just one more poll for you while we're here in live time. We're going to talk a little about what criteria is most important to you as you're thinking about your handpiece selection. Dr. Jablo has touched on a number of criteria that are relevant considerations as you think about your purchase. What's most relevant for you? Is it the head size and angulation, the sound level, the ergonomic design, its ability to deliver water, the fiber optics, your ability to autoclave it, or are you not quite yet at that phase of your career? I'll leave it open just for a little bit longer. Coming fast and furious now. Interesting profile. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing this. Yeah, me too. Making good headway. Sorry for those of you who are listening and not seeing in front of your desktop or your iPads this evening, your tablets, uh, but I'll share those results with you as a follow-up so you can have some visibility for yourself too. Still coming in, so I'm gonna leave it open just a second longer. Got about 17 seconds left and counting. Dr. Jablo, do you have a horse in this race? What do you think? Any predictions? Um, I think it's going to be either the ergonomic design or the head size. I think I, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go ergonomic design, head size, and check this out. Head size, sound. Huh, that's interesting, ergonomic. So uh, I may have gotten uh... – <laughs> Ergo and head size, just as you suspected. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, so, yeah, I think those two things. Now, with the head size, you know, since you, since you brought it up, the head size is important. And, you know, again, you got to pick those, the manufacturer and find the one that works for you. But now here's the other thing. And, yes, you want to try and, you know, get them all together, but most of them use an E-type connection. So you can mix and match. 
in my office, I got everybody's. Okay? okay. I've got VNAs, I got cables, I've got NSKs, I got them all, and I put them on different motors. All right, depending on what room I've got. I even got one just to test off of eBay, a cheap Chinese one. Do not do that. It wasn't very good. Okay? Save your money. You know, I, I'm at a point where I can test some of this stuff just to see what happens, but uh, I would not recommend it. You know, it's definitely not built anywhere near as well as any of the other ones that I man that I just, just mentioned. So, you know, eBay is your friend for many things dental. This one isn't something that I would go eBay, all right? And uh, as, as part of a big dental group thing that we were doing, I took one for the team and actually bought it and then reported back to the three or 4,000 dentists in this Facebook group and go, nah, go buy it, you know, spend, spend double the price and get the real thing. So take just, just a team. little tip there. Uh, yeah, for yeah sure. I took one for the team for for about for a couple hundred bucks uh, or 250 bucks. So, is what it is. All right. So, what speed do you choose? Well, that depends on your procedure. You know, we've talked about that. You know, do you want the red ones for your high speed? You know, here's what we have. We got a whole bunch of red ones in my office. All right, because that's it day in and day out. We probably have about seven or eight red ones because we're going to run them through sterilization and we got to make sure we have one at all times. Then we use the, I've got probably four blue ones that I don't use all that often. Okay. I mean, I use them, you know, here and there. I use them for polishing. I use them for that, but I don't necessarily use them at the same rate that I use the, uh, the high speeds. And I've got two of the uh, reduction hand pieces for endo. Now, here's the other thing. You can set these things up because when there's always that day in my office where somebody didn't pay attention and maybe I've got three root canals back to back to back and I only got two of those hand pieces and they didn't run it through fast enough to get it back to me. I can set the one to one up to do endo in my practice. As long as the parameters inside that motor will accept it, I can do that. So again, you want to look at your motors and see how versatile they may be. But, you know, in a pinch, I can use a blue one instead of a green one to do end up. Just a, just a thought. All right, so again, you're going to do your, your restored dentistry, you know, and we're going to use 150 to 200,000 RPMs in most cases. You know, carries removal, I'll back it all the way down, all right? We may use the blue handpiece in that case because if I'm using one of those, um, you know, ceramic burrs, or, or a conventional latch burr, I'm going to need that. But in a, but I can just as easy put a friction grip round burr in here and dial it all the way down to 5,000 RPMs and remove carries that way. Again, back to the blue one, you know, latch grip in many cases, we can do that. You want to remove gutta percha or you want to use uh, uh, Gates Glidden, you know, to start your endo, depending on what you're doing, you can dial those in directly, um, you know, to get that done, and polishing is usually somewhere in five to 10,000 RPMs. And again, now the green ones, you know, eight endodontics, how much torque, you can set it to auto reverse and auto forward. So what's auto forward? Well, you know, when if that burr starts to bog down and it reverses out, well, you can lift your foot off and guess what? You can turn it back so it starts in. So you're not pulling this thing in and out the same way. You get it out of the canal a little bit so it's now able to twist, you know, without engaging the walls, and now it can auto forward and you can put it back in. Just save you time and effort. You have less burr inventory because I don't need latch burrs for everything that I'm doing. Um, so in my office, we have minimal latch burrs because I can actually put them in to a high-speed handpiece and uh, in, into the high-speed handpiece and use them as I would a slow speed. And the cost of the units. Well, obviously, an electric handpiece costs more than the air. So if you needed a dozen handpieces tomorrow, it's going to cost you significantly more to, to get an electric one. But it's really, when you look at it over time, it's, it's going to probably save you money, and it's going to make your dentistry easier to do. So again, you don't need a dozen. You can probably start out depending on how you're going, you know, how busy you are and also how you're going to sterilize them. If you're using something like a statum versus an autoclave, you know, the number of hand pieces you may need may be reduced. And there's always deals from all the manufacturers in terms of what you can, you know, how many hand pieces you can get and everything else. Um, 
So look at that. And in some cases, there's, um, you can even, I've seen, uh, you know, dental students decide, well, they're not using their electrics. You can go buy them from them. Uh, you know, they're out of school a couple of years, they're working for somebody else, they're not using them. Hey, you know what, they're for sale, consider them. And then everything, it's time, money, it's a balance between all of them. The only thing that I routinely do in my office with an air handpiece is I adjust crowns and, and things like that with it. And the reason is not that it's, it's easier or anything else or harder, it's just because it keeps my, the uh, electrics available for what I really need them for, which is operative and restorative dentistry. So, you know, adjusting a little porcelain or uh, zirconia or Emacs, I might as well just use the air handpiece because it's really not going to make a big difference to me. Um, I don't need that torque. I don't need that, you know, that precision. Um, and so that's what we do. It. That's what I do in my office is I just do it that way. So the only air handpiece I routinely use, and we have two or three of them that we can just throw on, are the uh, are for just adjusting crowns or maybe cutting off some RPD piece or just in the, the framework. All right, discussion time. Hopefully I timed that pretty well. Yeah, yes, within sir. a couple minutes. So, all right, so where do I get these? Are you going to read the, the questions or how am I getting these questions? Yes, I am. Okay. All right, can you hear me okay? Sure can. All right. Our first question is from Jennifer, and she asks, when you're cutting into a zirconia burr with a, with a handpiece like this, about how many, uh, how many burrs do you go through on a molar tooth that's been covered with zirconia crowns? All right. I would tell you that if you don't, you know, like I said, you want to you want to knock down the RPMs a bit. You know, from the two hundred thousand, you don't need that. I'd probably knock it down to a hundred to one hundred twenty-five thousand, and it depends. If you're using you know regular burrs, uh, you know disposable diamonds, I probably would tell you it's one or two um, to get through it because all you need to do for these, as long as it's not complete now. It, in my case, I do not bond every crown in, all right, because I don't think it's necessary. If you've got good resistance and retention form, you don't need to bond. So what you're going to do is you're just going to slice into this. You know, I'll cut, um, I'll cut a, 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 what do you call it? Just, I'll just cut through it, like let's say on the buckle, and about a third to a halfway across the occlusal. And if I can get an instrument in there, I can crack the thing in two pieces and it comes off fairly clean. I did have one the other day. I had to cut off in four or five pieces. It just happened not to want to cooperate. Um, so obviously it took a little bit more effort, but again, I, I'd say normally one to two. In bad cases, it could be two to three. If you've got better, um, you know, diamond burrs, you're probably looking at one or two tops. You know, so there is an expense to go with cutting off zirconia but it's much easier that using this than it would be an air handpiece. Dr. Jablo, can you talk about some pointers or share some insights on how you access difficult areas, areas like mandibular linguals, maxillary molars, class fives, things of that sort? Okay, um, well, one of the things I have in the, now, in dental school, you all put a rubber dam on, I would believe at this point, you know, and it's one of the first things you stop doing when you get out of dental school, all right? Um, but there's huge advantages to isolation. Now, do I put on a rubber dam on every patient? The answer to that is no. Um, what we use in my office to, to make things in most cases easier um, is we use a couple of devices. One's called a dry shield and the other's called an isolate. And they both do the same thing. Basically, they're a mouthpiece that, that with this piece, big silicone piece that wraps around the tongue and the cheek and kind of retracts the tongue, cheek, and suctions all at the same, the same time. So for my assistant, I call it assisting became a spectator sport. Um, but, you know, when we look at those things, that's, that's how I do it in my office. Um, but there's still things like cotton rolls or retract, retractor um, hand, hand held instruments um, with those that, you know, are not a mouth mirror. See, we default to the mouth mirror all the time, and the mouth mirror was never meant as a retractor. And there are 
people who have manufactured, you know, regular retractors. So they're going to grab a tongue easier or pull the cheek back because they're bigger. Um, you might want to look for some of those things that that's going to make your access much, much easier. For our younger students, can you talk about how you would recommend that they build up their hand skills with their hand pieces as you start to think about hypodonts and making their way into the clinical environment for the first time? How would you um, give some guidance in that respect? With that, it's just about cutting. It's time, you know, and, and taking the time to do it, and you're going to go through a whole bunch of things. Ivory teeth are not enamel and dentin. That's the first thing. They don't cut the same as much as they'd like to tell you they're similar, they're not. Um, and then some teeth, the enamel and the teeth are harder. It's, it, you can feel the difference. It's harder to cut them. Um, I don't have any magic for that um, other than it's practice, practice, and more practice to do it. Uh, and you will develop the skills. The main thing is the frustration, all right? Um, and dental school and the dental school faculty are great at making you frustrated. And I know it, I've lived it, and I've heard it back at me. Uh, so don't always take that, you know, directly. You know, you got to try and let that go, and it's not always easy. Um, but the only thing I would tell you is you just got to keep practicing, and there is no magic. You, you will be able to do it. And I tell a story that I remember coming home one day, and I, I was so frustrated with dental school, it was, it was ridiculous. And I said, I can't do all of these things. I can't, you know, I, I may, it took me three hours to make like a three unit bridge temp. And, and these things are issues. And now I can do that same thing in about 10 minutes. The benefits now are the materials are better. There's better techniques of doing these things. You just have to, you know, experience it. You're just gonna have to grow into it, unfortunately. There's no magic. Uh, you also talked about your daily upkeep of your hand pieces and the, and the protocols that you seem to apply to make sure that your equipment and your instrumentation are right and ready to roll. Uh, how long does your daily maintenance routine take and who, who's responsible for that in your practice? So I can't even answer that question because I am not responsible for it, all right? I do know that they follow the protocol. So what, after you use a hand piece, they're going to run the water through it for, you know, uh, 30 seconds or so, we do that every day in the morning. We start, you know, we, we're going to flush the lines, um, and then we're going to place the oil. And if you have, you know, that's a manual way of doing it. And then they have these hand piece, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it, uh, cleaners, centers, where you can actually put the hand pieces on the attachments and it'll, it'll lubricate them and blow the air through it and do all that stuff that your assistant might be doing manually in a room. Um, how long does it take for them to clean this stuff? I don't know. I'll be honest. I haven't done it probably no. much of ever. So Sounds I, like I, you have some good systems in place, right? Yeah. I mean, you go, if you look at a manufacturer, they all sell these little centers for, for a handpiece maintenance. And you might want to consider that, but you can still do it manually. Just, just read the, read the manual. That's it, you know. And dentists are the worst, okay? They do not read. You know, it's like, I, I'm big into tech stuff. And, you know, all these forums and people asking questions and probably a good 35% of them are answered if you read the manual. But, you know, that's that paper that nobody looks at. <laughs> And dentists are really, really good at thinking that their assistant read it. And if there was something important, their assistant will tell them. Read the manual yourself. It's very important. All right. Uh, think about from, from your hand fatigue standpoint, we have a question. Do you do anything to help with your hands, stretching them, flexing them? What do you do to keep your hands when you've got one of those long procedures lined up in front of you? Take a break. Give yourself enough time. You know, I, I like to say if we're going to do one of those big procedures, I definitely want to make sure that the patient has break time and I have break time. Now, I get break time in my office in most cases because at some point there's a hygienist standing at the door going, I'm ready, all right? And now I got to go off and do that. So, you know, that's the time the patient gets a break or I get a break uh, in that. But there's plenty of times I've just flexed my hands or, you know, do one of these, 
just trying to stretch them out. Actually, right now, I think I got a little bit of tendonitis running through here. Um, and I've had different little hand things. Thank God, you know, none of them have been debilitating, and they usually go away with rest and, you know, and those kind of things. But I, there's nothing special that I'm doing. I'm not doing exercises. I don't have a stress ball that I'm going like this with. Um, you know, just stretch your hands. Um, there's exercises, things you can do if you're having those issues, you know, speak with an orthopedic surgeon or hand surgeon um, and ask them. But, you know, lucky me, I, I don't have back, neck, or, uh, you know, uh, hand problems. That sound you hear, folks, is Dr. Jablo knocking on wood right now. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. have one more question that came in while while you were responding about the maintenance. I know you had remarked previously that you don't have a lot of, of, of handling to, to do maintenance. How often do your electrics need, need some type of attention in that way? Not often. That's really it. Um, I'm thinking in all the years I've been using electrics, I think it's maybe two or three have gone in for some kind of service. Um, oh, and one doesn't count. One was a prototype. So now that I think about that, one was a prototype. It had no serial number on it. <laughs> That's how much of a prototype it is. I used that probably for a few years. And the other thing, too, that I didn't discuss was with electric can pieces, you know, if you listen to some of the older dentists, they'll tell you, oh, they burned patients and there were some issues. And there were, okay? Most of those have been are out of the picture. We're not burning patients. And that was usually because they, they, as we all do, we would use the head of the handpiece to retract and what would, would have the cheek and then the thing would spin on the bearings. Now there's a big difference. Airs have turbines, electrics have gears. They don't have, they don't have a turbine, all right? And those gears would, would run around there and heat up and the only time that I've seen a, a newer electric handpiece heat up is there's those gears are failing. And the patient usually go, ouch, and you'll touch it, it's burning, that's no good, you did it out of service and you either have to service it or get a new one. But uh, like I said, I, I think I've had, I forget the prototype that I'm thinking of, I think I've serviced two in over a decade. Outstanding. Well, folks, we're starting to wind down. We're just in our home stretch here. If you have any last questions, Dr. Jablo has been really generous with his time and his insight tonight. I know he'll take a couple more if you have some last questions. That yeah, and if it's like not about apply. hand pieces, and if it's not about hand pieces, ask anyway. All right. A couple other ones coming in. Uh, any tips for the new dentist on handpiece positions? Uh, for example, if you're crown prepping number two or number 15, distal buckle. Um, first thing, magnification, wear magnification, all right? I, I know in many dental schools they require you to buy it. Not everybody's wearing it. Um, that's, that's a big deal. If you can see it well, you can do it well. Um, so I think that that's a big thing when we're looking to prep. Um, obviously, isolation is a little harder back there. Uh, you know, if you can't, you, if you're concerned about lacerating cheeks, um, there's, there's a bunch of different things out there that, uh, there's absorbent pads. I'm trying to think of uh, dry shields or, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but we've got a bunch of those that you can stick in there. It'll actually stick to the cheek. I'd rather cut, I'd rather have that thing on the cheek than cut the cheek. So those are a couple of little tips of trying to get up, you know, on that distal buckle, which it's, it's hard. It's just no, you know, that's, again, that's experience of what to do and where and hope that the patient can, it's not open and wide there. You know, they've got to close. So can they close enough for you to see? You know what? You may even have to get up out of the chair and do those non-ergonomic things that aren't good for your back and neck sometimes. You do what you got to do. Uh, for the good of the patient, right? Yeah. Um, what type of motor? Do you have a recommendation that you use for your implant placement? Um, for my implant placement, there's a whole bunch of different motors out there. I happen to use an Aseptico. Um, there's the, uh, the BN Air, which are really nice too. Um, and Blue Sky Bios, uh, they have this box one. I can't remember the name of it. It's probably the least expensive and it's a really good, you know, workhorse. But again, you know, go, go look around, go see what's going to fit your budget and, Go ask some people. There's plenty of places 
online, you know, to, to go ask those questions. But th those would be from the, the Blue Sky Bio Box that there you're selling all the way up to the I, uh, I, Icono from BNR is probably the most expensive. It's got this real nice iPad that sits on top of it and gives you all this information that, you know, probably you won't need, but it's a very nice unit. And they're all electric, okay. by the way. So, <laughs> anyone else with a question? Otherwise, we're going to let Dr. Jablo introduce us to our uh, the continuation of our series and explain what's on tap for our second and third parts of this webinar continuum. Is that it? Okay. Anything yes, else, sir? If you would, would you advance us just one further? All right, there we go. So October 10th at 9 o'clock, the principles for removing existing restorations with my buddy Bob Lowe. Okay, Bob's a great restorative dentist, personal friend of mine, and you're going to get a lot of great tips on doing that. And then on the 31st, ooh, who scheduled that one? Halloween night. Spooky. Um, you know, it's spooky, you know, how to maintain your handpiece. So um, ask Mr. Williams, he'll be able to explain how to do that better than I would, but um, you know, it's important to maintain them. They're investments in your practice and they're the tools that you use. So whether you would be a carpenter and you know, you have those set of tools, these are your tools you need to take, take good care of them. So, you know, um, carve out a little time, hopefully on Halloween to, to see that. All right. Thanks everyone. We appreciate your attention this evening and certainly a big thanks go out to our sponsor NSK for making this all possible for bringing Dr. Jablo to us and allowing him to share his expertise with us. We're going to close just with a quick survey. If you wouldn't mind before you depart the, the virtual learning event, we'd love to have some of that feedback, as I mentioned, so that we can continue to shape these activities and put together a valuable program for you in the future. Uh, special thanks to our, our, our really great speaker tonight, Dr. Martin Jablo. And I know he said that he'd share with you just some of his information if you wanted to follow up with a question after this, um, just to continue your learning experience. He's a really great um, and generous man with his time. And, if you take him up on it, I'm sure he'd be quick to the to it, quick yeah. to the trigger. You can go to the De Not Dental Technology Coach website, but if you Google me, you can go to my blog. You'll find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you need to online. Just Google my name. You'll get to me somehow, some way, um, and I'll be happy to answer any other technology questions. Like I said, it doesn't have to be about hand pieces. All right. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Jablo, and thanks to all our attendees. We look forward to seeing you for parts two and three later on next month. Thank you so much. All right, folks. Good luck. Good night, everyone. Good night.